Good morning and welcome to North Lake Baptist Church. So good to see you. You know, as King David uh, experienced a storm in Psalm 25, he wrote about it. He wrote about that storm and he tells us to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And so may we also give glory and worship the Lord this morning as we enjoy the changing of the season, seasons, the cooling temperatures and the fall foliage. Uh, it's going to be the Lord's canvas here in the next few weeks and we're going to enjoy it and it's a wonderful time to be in the house of the Lord. Guests, we want to thank you for joining us this morning as we worship. Uh, at the end of the service, we invite you to take a welcome uh, gift bag uh, that's located right there at the door on your way out of the sanctuary. And again, we just want to thank you for joining us this morning. Church family, let's open up our bulletins and look at our announcements, how we can join in ministry this week. Uh, we have a new members class beginning tonight at 6.30. So new members uh, at 6.30 tonight, uh, you're enrolled in that class. We want you to be a part of that class. Even if you're just thinking about joining North Lake, that'd be a wonderful opportunity for you to know more and to get to know North Lake Baptist Church more. So we invite you as well to join that class tonight at 6.30. Our women's Bible study, Jesus is Better, will uh, continue tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. So ladies, uh, I know you're looking forward to continuing in your study of the book of Hebrews uh, tomorrow night. Uh, children, parents, this Wednesday our Awana program begins this Wednesday night from 6 to 6.15 uh, is registration and classes will begin promptly at 6.15. Uh, students, uh, I hope you're ready for Friday. This Friday at 5.30, we'll be meeting at the church, loading up on the bus to go on our fall retreat, uh, Love Keeps, where we're going to talk about and study God's Word and, and learn more about obeying God. We'll be heading down to Camp Kaleo in Forsyth, Georgia, and so we're, we're going to have a wonderful time there. Church, we are in the midst of a missions project. Our backpacks for Appalachia, you can see uh, to my left, to your right, uh, you can pick up the information needed to pack a backpack. But we do uh, understand that uh, during this pandemic, you might not want to go shopping, uh, but you can still participate. You can contribute to Backpack for Appalachia through a, a, a gift. And uh, I know our students on November 1st, we'd love to go and do that shopping spree and pack those backpacks for you. Our goal, church, is 100 backpacks for children in Appalachia. So I'm sure we will meet that goal. Uh, one, uh, church wants you to mark your calendar for November 1st. Those backpacks are due November 1st, but also uh, that evening we're going to have a movie night on the lawn for the church. Uh, we're going to watch the movie Overcomer, and so uh, put that down on your calendar and, and join us that evening for the movie Overcomer. Now, church, we have a bulletin insert. We have a unique opportunity. Everybody look at that insert, please. Uh, because of a gen generous donor, uh, we are going to give out free shirts, okay? And so our church family, our online community, uh, if you're a follower, a subscriber, we want to uh, give you this opportunity to get a North Lake Baptist shirt. And so uh, let's look at these instructions. You can visit our website. You can go to northlakebaptist.org forward slash shirt. All right. And there you'll see uh, the two types of shirts uh, that you can get. Uh, there's either a navy blue polo or a T-shirt that says North Lake Baptist. And it has mountains and it has part of our mission statement to exalt the Savior, to evangelize the sinner, to equip the saints and encourage the soul. And we pray that this will be an opportunity to be a conversation starter for our church here and for our subscribers and followers abroad. We hope it gives you the opportunity to have a conversation about Jesus Christ and to share the gospel with those around you in your community. So you can do that. There'll be uh, one shirt per person, free, but if you'd like to order additional shirts, there'll be another link 
that you can go out and order as many shirts as you'd like. All right, and that, that link will be open for a couple of weeks, and uh, we look forward to seeing what God will do uh, through those shirts. Also, church, uh, we have much to celebrate at, at North Lake. It's Anniversary Sunday. It's North Lake's 40th anniversary. So let's give the Lord a hand. God has blessed North Lake with 40 years of ministry. And the stewardship team has designated Sunday, October 25th, the entire offering for Sunday, October 25th, will go to our new sanctuary building fund. So come ready on October 25th. We're also going to recognize on October 25th our charter members and our new members on that Sunday. So come and uh, we'll have a wonderful day of worship on October 25th. And may Paul's prayer for the Philippian church be our prayer for North Lake saying, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge, in every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Matt, for sharing that with us. And what a wonderful day. Thank you for being here today. What a wonderful day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the resurrection of our Savior today. We're going to worship Him together. You came here to worship. You're online listening, and, and we're glad you're part of our worship time together. But you know, we, we're going through some beautiful weather and beautiful season right now, but we're also in a, in a trying time with a pandemic going on a lot of confusion going on what's going on i found myself many times a, a humming this verse a, a verse to this song that says uh, because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know who holds the future life is worth the living because he lives Let's stand together and worship Jesus Christ as he rose from the grave today that we may have everlasting life with him. Let's sing together. Uh, because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to
opportunity now to share that and tell others about Jesus Christ evangelizing the world tell them about the cross the way of the cross leads home I must needs go home by the way of the cross Jesus said deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me let's sing that together <clears throat> I must needs go home by the way of the cross there's no other way but I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of life if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross. I must needs go on, on the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime, where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Can I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it nevermore? For my Lord says, come and I seek my home Where he waits at the open door The way of the cross leads home The way of the cross leads home It is sweet to know as I onward go Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Yes, thank you, Terry. Great singing this morning. If you have your bulletins, look at the back page. We'll look at our prayer list today. Our prayer verse comes from 3 John. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So don't forget to pray for souls as well. Uh, we often pray about everything else, but pray uh, for people's souls. Um, as we've already mentioned earlier, today is the 40th anniversary at Northlake. Uh, normally, 
Uh, we'd be preparing for dinner on the ground after this was over. Uh, you'd be smelling barbecue and wishing I'd hurry up and get through preaching so we could get to it. So we'll have to put that off for about a year uh, because of the current uh, epidemic we've got going on here. Uh, but we do praise the Lord uh, for the work that was started here uh, 30, uh, 40 years ago at North Lake. We also praise the Lord for those who joined last week, Jim and Laurie, and also for Emil Decker and Kelly Smith and Robbie Weber uh, who are improving and doing uh, better. Uh, we also want to pray for those in need of salvation. Uh, think about those in your circle of friends and ask yourself, who's your one that you're praying for and seeking to lead them to faith in Christ? Uh, we've got a, a pretty active uh, uh, prayer list from our church family. Uh, uh, Don uh, Crawford will be having a heart catheterization tomorrow, so be in prayer for him. And I think Joanne is preparing for some knee surgery, so pray for both of those. Uh, also, uh, update on uh, my wife, Laura. And the thing is, we got good news. Uh, she does not have cancer. She has something called thrombocythemia. And she's, uh, it's, uh, you can live through that. And so we're praising the Lord for that. She started on some meds this past week. And so, um, so we're grateful for that. We do have some folks with, uh, with, that's been COVID positive. Again, we mentioned Emil and Linda Decker. Uh, Gary and Julie Hulsey, Wanda Land, Amy and Derek Moore, and Jamie Wells, and also Nick Moore. Uh, and we're sad to announce this morning he passed away yesterday uh, from COVID and pneumonia and several other health concerns. And so we're going to miss Brother Nick. So pray for Peggy and uh, Derek and all the family as they go through this time of bereavement. Um, also, I want to pray for our parents who are expecting children. Uh, also, our extended family and friends and those in long-term care. Uh, we do pray for all of our missionaries serving around the world, and I wanted to highlight some local missionaries. Our Awana program, we're going to try to start that off this coming Wednesday night. Uh, they had a great leader meeting this past Wednesday night, and so we look forward to um, uh, restarting uh, some of our children's program, and we're going to start with Awana this coming Wednesday night. We also want to remember our president and the first lady who have also tested positive for COVID that uh, they get well soon so they can continue to lead the nation. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the beautiful fall weather uh, outside that enables your people to gather and come before you to worship you, the true and living God. We thank you, Lord, for how you bless us. And we do pray for souls today, for our own souls that you keep us encouraged, and also for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ their Savior, that we would be faithful to share the good news that Jesus saves with them, and that you would bless by the power of your Holy Spirit and bring others into your kingdom. We do pray for those in our congregation who are sick, that you would uh, put a healing touch upon them. To those who are bereaved, uh, Lord, uh, undergird them with the blessed hope that we have that we get to see our loved ones again in a place called heaven. Lord, bless us today as we continue to worship you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Amy. Anybody name that tune? How great is our God, amen? amen? If you have your Bibles, please open to Revelation chapter 13 as we continue our study. We'll start off with a quick review so we can know where we are uh, in this book. Again, Revelation chapters 10 through 14, we have an interlude or a break in the action between the seven trumpet judgments in chapters 8 and 9 and the bowl or seven bowl or vial judgments in chapters 15 and 16. The Lord adds uh, some scenes here in these chapters uh, to give John and us some clarity on God's judgment at the end of the age and what's going on with this. In chapter 10, uh, we saw the bittersweet little book that was closed and sealed uh, back in chapter 5, but now the seven seals have been broken and the book has been opened by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, revealing God's mysterious plan of redemption. And then we looked at chapter 11, where we saw the future temple in Jerusalem, where there is no temple now, but there will be a temple in the future. It's hard for us today, understanding the international situation, how that could happen. But the Bible says it's going to happen. And how many of you think the Bible's true? Amen. How many of you think maybe God was guessing at what might happen in the future? Uh, anyway, there will be a future temple in Jerusalem that will be built after the Antichrist is revealed. And there will be two witnesses who come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah to warn the world to repent. When we get to chapter 12, we saw a woman who we discovered was a family tree of Israel. Uh, giving birth to a male child who we discovered was Jesus Christ. We found out that there is a Christmas story in the book of Revelation. And in verse 3 of that chapter, we saw the great fiery red dragon, also known as the devil and Satan, and also a third of the angels, fallen angels called demons, and how they were cast out. Back in chapter 11, verse 7, we were also introduced to something, someone called the beast, which we identified as the Antichrist, which will be revealed after the rapture of the church that takes place in Revelation chapter 7. And now here we are in Revelation chapter 13, and we get a more detailed description of this beast that John calls the Antichrist and that Paul calls the man of sin or lawlessness. So let's pick it up in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave the authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And of course, the answer is no one. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, and those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. And there is the patience and the faith of the saints. Back to verse 1. It says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. If you've been reading forward, and I hope you have, it doesn't hurt to read forward. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4, it gives us a clue to the meaning of the sea. It talks about the sea as the waters, and the waters represent people and multitude and nations and tongues. So somewhere out of these 7.8 billion people on earth, this beast, this antichrist, will rise from the ranks of people and will appear on the world scene. Uh, this beast to people who are living on the earth will seem like just another man who is lucky enough to become a world leader. But for those who are familiar with the Bible, he's just another iteration of the satanic powers of this world who have been in rebellion against God from the beginning. 
for behind his handsome face and I'm sure wearing a very nice business suit is a beast. Verse 1 calls him a beast having seven heads with ten horns with ten crowns. These seven heads represent the seven Gentile world powers that Satan has used to try to destroy the nation of Israel because God chose Israel way back when to bring about the birth of the Messiah, of his son, of Jesus Christ. These seven world powers listed in the Bible are number one, Egypt, which enslaved Israel for uh, 400 years. Number two would be Assyria, which destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, the third one would be Babylon, which destroyed the southern kingdom of Israel. Number four would be Persia, which produced a fellow named Haman, who tried to exterminate the Jews. And number five would be Greece, which produced Antiochus Epiphanes, who desecrated the temple at Jerusalem. Number six would be Rome, which destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And number seven will be this future world superpower led by the Antichrist, which according to Daniel chapter 2 and 7 will negotiate an alliance of ten horns with ten crowns or ten nations that will support the one world government of this beast. Back to verse 1, it says, On his heads a blasphemous name. Of course, to blaspheme means to use God's name in vain, a violation of the Ten Commandments, which is what the Antichrist will do, for he claims to be Christ, and he is not, which is blasphemy. Jesus warned about him. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, he said, For in the last days false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great wonders and signs to deceive. Paul the Apostle mentions the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. The man of sin, when he is revealed, he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And of course, that is blasphemy for anybody to claim to be God. This Antichrist will reign for seven years, according to Daniel chapter 9. The first three and a half years will be relatively peaceful. He will be the one who will figure out a way to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, which is going to be quite a feat if you think about it, to remove a Muslim mosque in order to rebuild the temple. He's going to pull it off, and no doubt, how many of y'all think you'll get the Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> a number of folks through the years have got those. It ended up not being very peaceful. The second three and a half years, he will reveal himself to be an unholy terror to the world in general, and to Israel in particular. Look at verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Back up to verse 2, we get a description of this beast, which actually matches, again, very few new details in Revelation. It's just other stuff in the Bible we may not have read or didn't remember reading, but this matches the same beast that we see in Daniel chapter 7. He will be like a lion, which is Babylon. He will be like a bear, which is the Persians. He will be like a leopard, which is the Greeks, and all those were strong superpowers in their day. But make no mistake, the Antichrist does not have strength in and of himself. Verse 2 tells us that the dragon gave him the power, his throne, and his great authority. Who is the dragon? Yeah, Satan, the devil. So the Antichrist is the incarnation of Satan, and though this Antichrist will seem new, he's just a continuation of the same old dictatorial model of those world superpowers from the past, like Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. In verses 3 and 4, uh, literally uh, speaking, this Antichrist will appear to rise from the dead. He will, uh, we'll send a resurrection from this guy. He's going to be, I guess, assassinated, mortally wounded, and then somehow or another he's going to be able to get up. And again, the Antichrist is a cheap imitation of the real Christ, and so he's going to give an appearance of invincibility. He's killed, but still he gets up. So who's going to be able to stop this guy? Figuratively, one of the seven heads which has long been dead will reappear. Most conservative scholars <clears throat> think there will be a resurrection of the Roman Empire. Uh, in the last days, and of course, Rome isn't much these days, so what we're talking about as far as the Roman Empire will be uh, means that probably the final world power will come out of the Western civilization, 
known as Europe or the United States. And then we look on to verses 7 and 8, and we'll find out this beast, this Antichrist, will dominate and rule the world. He will have a one-world government. We see that in uh, verse 2. He will have power and a throne and great authority. Verse 3, all the world will marvel at him and follow him. And when it says all the world, we mean all the world, not just a few countries. He will also have a one-world military. We'll see that in verse 4. Who is like this beast? Who is able to make war against this guy? Well, nobody. So, so we're all afraid of him. He will have one-world court. Look at verse 7. He'll have legal authority over every tribe and tongue and nation. Believe it or not, he will have a one-world religion. We're going to read about that in a few minutes, verses 11 through 15. You know, it's kind of strange to us as Americans living in American society because whenever a prayer is prayed in public or a verse of Scripture is read in public, what do people say? Ah, separation of church and state. We can't have that. We're a secular society. We, we're, we're separation of church and state. But get this, the new world order, there will be a marriage of church and state. There will be an apostate church, a fallen away church that everybody will join. You going to join it? Because if you still happen to be, how many of you still happen to plan to be here when this is going on? If you're a Christian, you need to be raptured, okay? But this is for those of you who chose not to anyway. So pay attention if you hadn't become a Christian yet. Um, there will be an apostate church that you'll have to join according to Romans 125. I believe it will be a godless religion of environmentalism and saving the planet and every tribe, tongue, and nation will agree because if you do not agree, then you will have to answer to the second beast. And yes, there is another beast. The Antichrist will have a false prophet who will cause all earth dwellers to worship the Antichrist and he will encourage people to worship through the fear of death to support this new world order, this global religion. Let's read about that. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast. Here you go. This is the second beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb. Well, Jesus was the Lamb of God. So again, a fake imitation of everything Jesus is. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He still spoke like the devil. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. You know, the guy who looked like he rose from the dead. He performs great signs so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image. I'm sure that's going to be some kind of artificial intelligence. But anyhow, it's going to be some idol. It's not going to be one of those fake idols from the past that nobody really believed, but they had to play with with ours. I mean, I think it's going to be believable in the future. Uh, the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So uh, what we have here is, again, encouragement to worship this. And again, if you don't want to worship, then you're going to be put to death. In addition to this one world religion, there's also going to be a one world economy. We read about that beginning in verse 16 where we're going to be given a lesson in global economics. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand, on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. So this false prophet is going to make you an offer that you can't refuse. In order to do business, to buy, to sell, to travel, to go to school, to go to the ball game, to get health care, you must receive a mark. Now I know there's a lot of superstition and conspiracy theories about this mark. I remember a few years ago standing in line behind somebody at Walmart, I think it was, and they bought some stuff, and it rang up to 666. And they quickly grabbed a pack of chewing gum and put it down there, too, so, it would, so that it wouldn't ring up that way on the receipt that they had to tote out of the store. I understand many hotels won't even make a room called 666 on the sixth floor. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure all that 666 means, but I think it is symbolic for what a counterfeit Satan really is. For example, Trinity is what? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And here we're introduced to an unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Also, God's number is a number of perfection. It is seven, so the trinity would be 777. That's based on the power of God. For God is the one who was. He's the Lord who created the world in the past in seven days. He is the Lord who is. He's the Lord who sustains the world in its presence seven days a week. He is the one who is to come. He's the Lord over human history that's going to be finished according to the Word of God in 7,000 years, seven 1,000-year days, seven days of humanity. Satan, on the other hand, his number is short. It is six. It is not seven. He's short of perfection because he's based on the power of human beings and human power. Look back to verse 18. It says, it's the number of a man. It's the anti-trinity. It's 666. The number of a man who was created on the sixth day of creation. The man who rebelled against God and crucified God's son on the sixth day of the week. And the man who made such a mess of things that the Lord has to destroy the world after six 1,000-year days as we enter into the 1,000-year millennium of Jesus Christ, which rounds out the seven. So again, all man can muster is 666, not 777. So this beast tries really hard to be as mighty as God still. He's just a man. This Antichrist is going to try what he will, but in the end, he's going to come up short. Looking back to verse 16, you see this mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast, not sure exactly how all that's going to work out. Again, there's a lot of wonderful theories out there. If you don't believe it, just go on the Internet and look around. All kind of great stuff out there. But the mark of the beast will be some kind of identification system that the false prophet and his global religion will use to force people to comply with this anti-Christian one world order. The question is, how will it work? Well, I believe that the components of this system have already been invented and are already starting to be in use today by businesses, by governments using high-tech means in order to track people. It's the wonder of computer technology. And for those who are younger than me, you probably don't understand how technology has grown. It's been phenomenal growth in the last 40 years. Of course, Daniel the prophet said in chapter 12, verse 4, uh, that there would be an increase in knowledge in the last days. And of course, again, if you're my age or a little older, you've seen a tremendous growth in the amount of information. Not that there's a great uh, degree of wisdom that's been increased, but there's a whole bunch of knowledge out there. But computer technology, think about that a minute. Um, when I got out of the Army, I went to work for Macy's in 1982. And I remember part of my introduction, I got taken down to our computer room. Do y'all remember what the computer rooms used to be like back then? They took me back in this thing. It was freezing cold, and it vibrated when the computers were running and all this kind of stuff. It was called a mainframe. And again, you couldn't know anything to the end of the day. You had to wait to the end of the day to run a batch job to find out what you sold earlier. I mean, this, this whole online real-time thing wasn't happening back then. And again, it was a monster. You had to have extra air conditioning and electricity in order to make this thing work. And here we are in 2020, and do you realize your smartphone has more computing ability than that whole room did uh, back in 1980? We've come a long way. These computers we have today can keep up with who you are, and numerical accounting of people. You know, names mean really nothing when you've got 8 billion people on the globe in order to try to keep up with. You need numbers. That's why we're all given a Social Security number when you're a baby so the IRS can track you. Driver's license number with uh, electronic fingerprints when you turn 16. You got debit cards and credit cards with microchip technology that links you to huge databases that keep up with your assets, your liabilities, your spending habits, all that monitored by credit bureaus. If you don't, try going and getting a loan sometime, find out how that works out. All this data is available to anybody who's willing to pay for it. And that's why you get junk mail in your mailbox, that's why you get email spam. And that's why when you go on a Google search, you ever figure out how when you go on Google searches, they got all the things that you might like on either side of the screen? That's because they know you. Google knows you. Why? Because they monitor you when you're letting your fingers do the walking on your computer. They not only know who you are, they know where you are. Thanks to global positioning systems and satellite technology, they can keep up with all of us wherever we are in the world. More innovations are coming online every day. Microchips the size of a grain of rice can store tremendous amounts of data, 
are built in with radio frequency identification, RFID, capable of transmitting uh, this data to scanning equipment. We've been using these RID. How many of you, your little dog at home or your little cat at home already has a chip the size of a grain? You didn't know they did that at the vet office? They do. That way, if your dog or cat ever gets lost, they can scan them and find out who they are. I wonder how hard that would be to transfer over to human beings. Speaking of, the latest thing is that biometric tattoo. That's been one of the most unnerving developments with our COVID-19 pandemic. Back in my April 19th sermon, if you remember, I referred to uh, an article in Scientific American Magazine dated December 23rd of 2019. They reported that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology had developed a biometric tattoo where a nanochip can be injected into your forearm at the same time that you are vaccinated. Therefore, your arm can be scanned to reveal your identity, your vaccinations, and other data. This biometric tattoo program is part of a bigger plan uh, called ID2020 uh, that was announced at the World Economic Forum in January of 2019, also sponsored by the Bill Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and several other billionaires. And of course, if you go online and look around, there's all kinds of rumors and news and fake news about how the government may use this biometric tattoo in order to verify that you've taken your COVID-19 vaccine, which is supposedly supposed to come out very soon. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't know whether any of that's true or not, but my only point is, is that the technology is already here for a future world dictator to do as the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16 to cause all people to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may be able to buy or sell except they have the mark. So it kind of seems to me, prophetically speaking, that we may be further along on God's calendar than any of us care to think about. Speaking of that, I, I guess I think too small. You know, I've been studying Revelation long before I became a preacher. I became a preacher 30 years ago, but I was studying before then. And even though I believe the Bible's true and it's all going to come true just the way God says it, I could not imagine how can somebody take over the whole world in just a few months. Have you ever thought about that? The world is a pretty big place. I mean, how do you take over Georgia in just a few months? But much less, how do you take over the entire world in just a few months? Because, you know, the Antichrist, if you believe Revelation, the Antichrist is only going to rule for about a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. And how can he put together a world government in a matter of months? Well, little did I know, this new world order was in the works a long time before I was born. Um, back in 2008, quite by accident, I was not looking for this, I received enlightenment from the Lord that we are nearer the end than I ever believed. Go back with me, those of you who can remember back this far, June of 2008. The presidential race was in its final stretch. Uh, the press was following every move of every candidate from both political parties as we were getting ready for the conventions, and, and uh, they were even covering what people were putting on the hamburgers. How many of you remember that? They were going around to see, you know, had cameras saying, oh, well, he puts this on his cheeseburger. I thought, you know, just covering it. Then all of a sudden, the Democrat front runners, uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, went missing. Do y'all remember that? Uh, Obama's press secretary, Robert Gibbs, lured the press corps onto Obama's plane, and they took off for a campaign stop in Chicago. But it turns out Obama was not on the plane. And the press was really upset that they were not informed. It was almost like they were being kidnapped. They were upset. Where was he? So they asked Robert Gibbs, who was his press secretary, where is he? And he said, no comment. And so they got on their phones and got back to their networks, and reporters were at President Obama, or future President Obama's apartment, couldn't find him. They were at Hillary's apartment, couldn't find him. It was a mystery. Where were they? And suddenly Obama appears in Chicago, and he announces that his running mate would be, not Hillary, but Joe Biden. And everybody's asking, what happened? What kind of meeting? What kind of place did he go to? Nobody in the world seems to know what's going on. And that's when it tripped me. That's, that's when I had my awakening. Um, when I was in the Army, when I came back from my assignment in Korea, I was uh, supposed to take this next assignment. The only problem was I had to be a first lieutenant. 
and I hadn't got there yet. I still needed three months. So they gave me a temporary assignment in the commanding general's office at the infantry center at Fort Benning, and it was called the Visitors Bureau. And me and several other guys were there, and our job was to keep up with very important visitors to Fort Benning. If you were a general or a colonel or a senator or a congressman or anybody high-ranking like that, it was our job to make sure that you had a great time while you were at Fort Benning, and most of all, we had to keep an eye on you to know where you were all the time. And so the main lesson I learned is we do not lose VIPs. We do not lose people who are on the cusp of being president of the United States. Now, the press may not know, but somebody knew where these guys were. So I went on the Internet and found a news website called WorldNet Daily, and they carried a story that Obama and Clinton were not actually missing. They were at a secretive meeting called Bilderberg at Chantilly, Virginia. Now, have you ever heard of the Bilderbergs? I had not. And if not for WorldNet Daily, I probably still would not. What kind of meeting could be so important, so secretive, that the media couldn't even cover it, didn't know where it was at? So I did a little research, and I discovered that the Bilderberg Group was a secret society of international billionaire bankers and businessmen. And, of course, the main power broker for the United States of America was David Rockefeller. Uh, he was, of course, the heir of the Standard Oil Fortune. He was a military intelligence officer in World War II. He was a billionaire banker and CEO of what is now J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Most of you may know he died in March 2017 at 101 years old, but even though he's dead, his legacy lives on. The Bilderberg Group is made up of mostly billionaires and a few hand-picked government leaders and university professor types. Uh, they meet annually since 1954 for the purpose of developing a new world order. Now, before you start visualizing the Saturday morning cartoon with the evil villain and the diabolical laugh, and I'm going to take over the world, they're not that kind of guys, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, I think, really, these people have the best of intentions, and they are seriously planning for the future of humanity. Because I think after World War II, it dawned on them that all the rules that had guided humanity for centuries had suddenly changed because we were now in a nuclear age. And if every nation suddenly had nukes, then we'd all live every moment on the brink of annihilation. After World War II, we had advances in aviation, in electronics, communications, travel, trade. The whole world had gone international during the war. And with all this intermingling of people, then that means crime and terror were uh, now not national problems, they were international problems, but the problem is we didn't have any international sheriff. After World War II, it was generally agreed that we needed something to nip all the little Hitlers in the bud before we could end up with another world war. Then you had this idea of disease and epidemics which could spread from continent to continent rapidly. Now, how many of us know about spreading from continent to continent? All that's happened. Well, before, you used to have these oceans that would kind of protect you because it took a while for a ship to cross the ocean. Well, now with an airplane, you know, you can be there in less than a day. So things were getting complicated. Stronger nations could exploit and pollute weaker nations, uh, not to mention international waters with fishing rights and oil drilling rights and all this kind of stuff. Well, how do you solve all these international problems if you've got 192 nations doing their own thing? Well, the answer is you can't. So the answer was the United Nations. But it turns out the United Nations was no accidental idea. There were lots of planning and strategy. Uh, David Rockefeller's father, John Jr., actually donated the land for the United Nations building in New York City. And, of course, the United Nations was established right after the war in 1945. And again, Rockefeller and his fellow billionaires started, I believe, with good intentions. But remember that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Anyway, to tackle all these global problems that we now had following World War II, David Rockefeller set up some global organizations. Of course, one of them was already set up, and that was the Bilderberg Group, 1954, a uh, network of billionaire world leaders who thought they could solve all the world's problems. The reason the press didn't cover it is because it's secret. It's so experts can talk out loud about how to fix all the problems of the world without scaring the little people like you and me. Uh, another outfit is the Council on Foreign Relations. Founded in 1921, David Rockefeller took over the, as director in 1949. 
It was made up of mostly Americans, uh, U.S. policymakers, diplomats, movers and shakers in the government, business, and education. It's a globalist think tank uh, where they get together and talk about a new world order. And over time, this Council on Foreign Relations, which is located at least one office in Washington, D.C., it's kind of become the personnel department. So if you're a new congressman, you get up there, you don't know what you're doing, don't even know how to find the mailbox, call the Council on Foreign Relations, and they'll send an expert over to help you. And guess what? They also help you know how to vote on things. Another outfit that uh, Rockefeller started was the Trilateral Commission. He founded it in 1973. Tri means three, of course. Uh, U uh, U.S., Europe, and Japan. See, the Bilderberg Group was pretty much European and American. Well, David Rockefeller thought we need a little bit more Asian involvement in international affairs, so he did the Trilateral Commission to add the Pacific uh, Rim to that. Another little known thing that he was involved in is something called the Tavistock Institute. It was started in Britain in 1947 with Rockefeller Foundation money, and they specialize in psychological warfare, mass brainwashing. Uh, David Rockefeller brought it to the United States to study things like how do you get masses of people uh, to buy into your ideas. I wonder why he wanted to do that. Anyway, these groups started with a whole new concept for changing the world. The old ideas of conquering the world using war and diplomacy were no longer effective, so the new idea is to control the world through business and monetary policy. Business was already international, so why not use mega corporations in order to control the world? So now we have a new golden rule. Does anybody remember what the old golden rule used to be? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The new golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. So that's, that's what they decided to do. It takes money to fight wars, to do politics, to create power. So use money to solve the world's problems. The old debates like capitalism, communism, conservatives and liberals, Republicans, Democrats, no longer matter. We need this new world order by any means possible. And so thus it began. For more than 70 years, members of Rockefeller organizations have influenced every U.S. presidency since Eisenhower. Most presidents were members, like Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, Ford, Carter, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton. And even the presidents who were not members were surrounded by vice presidents or cabinet secretaries or advisors who were Rockefeller men or women. For example, George W. Bush was technically not a Bilderberg, but his father was, and so was his vice president, Dick Cheney, and so were his secretaries of state, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. So were his secretaries of defense, Rumsfeld and Gates. So was his Secretary of Treasury, Hank Paulson, who, by the way, presided over the economic crash of 2008. The next president, Barack Obama, appears out of nowhere with a blank resume. Well, how does he become president of the United States? Well, it turns out he was handpicked and groomed by George Soros, who happens to be a billionaire B a Bilderberg. Three-fourths of his cabinet and advisors were Bilderbergs or members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Even Donald Trump, Mr. Make America Great Again, not a Bilderberg that we can prove, but members of his cabinet are Bilderbergs and Council on Foreign Relations. And we do know that the president and his cabinet attended the World Economic Forum in Davos, which are also billionaires, the last two to three years. And of course, all this, you know, you start to stop and think about it, so why would somebody who, like Rockefeller who is the ultimate capitalist, want people with such radical ideas as socialism to be in leadership position. I mean, this is going to destroy America. Well, you got to remember, that's the plan. In order to move to a new world order, you got to get rid of the old world order. Nationalism must decrease. Internationalism must increase. America must go down before the new world order can go up, and there are no superpowers in a one world order. So... You say, well, Danny, why don't we hear about this in the press? Well, you got to remember, these Rockefeller guys who control the press, uh, they're leader, leaders from PBS, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, all these guys. Bilderbergs are on the Council of Foreign Relations. You say, about, what about Fox? You know, we all listen to Fox because we're Baptists. You know, we've got to listen to Fox. They're, they're fair and balanced. We can listen to those folks. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rupert Murdoch, who owns Fox, Bilderberg, and Council on Foreign Relations. 
You know, well, why all the mudslinging between Fox and all the other media? I mean, they act like they're enemies. That's what you call Tavistock brainwashing. Keep people confused, perplexed, frustrated, overwhelmed. It leaves them depressed, hopeless, helpless, willing sheep for the new world order. Remember my Hegelian dialectic that I mentioned back on my uh, April the 19th sermon? Remember, it's a three-step dance. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, also known as problem, reaction, solution. Basically, what you do is you set up two extreme positions, and then you move the sheep to the middle, which is where you want them to be to start with. You may say, well, Danny, I'm, I'm really upset now. I'm going to write my congressman. Good luck with that. Most members of Congress do not start off rich. So how do they become rich? Well, they have to raise money in order to run. Well, where do you get the money to run for office? Billionaire, bankers, and businessmen. And once they go to Washington, again, most of them don't know what to do. When they get to Washington, they've got to put a staff together. Where do you get your staff? Oh, I know. Call the Council of Foreign Relations, and they'll send some folks over. I know a lot of our folks listen to talk radio. They have all the solutions to the world's problems, too. We can turn this all around if we'll just vote Republican. Folks, it doesn't matter who gets elected. The Rockefellers back both sides. If you don't believe it, go to one of these contributions websites like opensecrets.org and see who gives the money to these campaigns, and you'll find out they give the money to both campaigns. They've also lobbied to make it almost impossible for a third party to run. Why? Because they only want to pay for two parties. <laughs> so, so we've got to keep this thing simple. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. I know we're running out of time, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. Do I think th these guys are trying to take over the world for their own benefit? Probably some are. But I think most of them honestly think that mankind can solve our, only our own problems if we just put our minds to it. David Rockefeller, in 2002, authored his autobiography called Memoirs. On page 368, Rockefeller wrote, for more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Fidel Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for their inordinate influence that they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we're part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States. Characterizing my family and me as internationalist and conspiring with others around the world to build an integrated global political and economic structure, a one world order, if you will. If that's what the charge is, then I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Now, I don't think you can accuse me of spreading a conspiracy theory if David Rockefeller owns up to it and says he's proud of it. But you know what? Back to Revelation chapter 13. Regardless of how smart Rockefeller and his billionaire buddies think they are, one day soon, these global manipulators are going to get manipulated. And they are going to appoint a world leader who the Bible calls the beast, the man of sin, or the Antichrist. And he's going to turn the tables on their grandiose scheme. And he will put their new world order to work for his purposes and he will take control of the world using government, courts, military, and money. And I'm hearing now, well, Danny, what can we do? What can we do? Well, I don't know, maybe we can turn to the politicians. What do you think? No, it takes big money to run for office for by the time people get to Washington, they've already been tainted by money. Realize it takes approximately these days three billion dollars to run for president of the United States. You know how much the president makes per year? 400,000. Now how many of y'all would spend three billion dollars to get a job that only pays four hundred thousand dollars? I don't know, I think being a senator is a much better deal. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. You can run for senate for ten million dollars for a salary that pays 175,000 a year. Somebody tell me what's going on mathematically here. There's got to be something going on behind the scene that makes people want to go and do these things. So, again, I don't think politics is the answer. Maybe we can turn to our military. You know, they're patriotic. We can get the military involved here. Well, 
you got to remember, most of your top brass, the ones that make it up to four stars, um, are either Bilderbergs themselves or Council on Foreign Relations members. I got interested once I started digging on this back in 2008, and I said, well, I wonder if my commanders, how many in my chain of command were actually Rockefeller guys? So I went back and started looking them up, and uh, Secretary of Defense, when I was in there, two of those, Harold Brown, Casper Weinberger, all Bilderbergs, Army Chief of Staff of General Edward Meyer, uh, he was. Eighth Army Commanders in Korea, uh, General John Wickham, and John, v I actually met John Vesey. He came to our chow hall at Christmas one time. I thought he was a real nice guy. He's also a Bilderberg. Uh, NATO Commander, General Al Haig. You know, even in retirement, even these guys were retired at the time that I looked up their names, and they're still carrying water for the New World Order. I wish we had that kind of zeal in the church, don't you? Don't you wish that people were still, well, I know it's time for me to retire, but I'm still going to give everything that I got to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, these guys here, they're giving their last breath to building this new world order for the Antichrist. Well, Danny, why don't the press report on this? Again, most of the media is owned by about six corporations whose CEOs are Council on Foreign Relations or Bilderberg members. And guess what? They get to decide what the lead stories are. Have you ever wondered when you flip between channels, they're all carrying the same stories? Why is that? You think, well, all that's going on in the world today, there's got to be more than five or six lead stories that everybody carries. Somebody's got to have an original thought out there. You say, well, Danny, you're killing me. You're depressing me. If we can't look to Washington or New York, and if we can't look to Republicans or Democrats... We can't look to the left or the right for help. What's left? Look up. Look up. Jesus speaks to us in Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, 28. When these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption is drawing near. You know, the Rockefeller, one thing you can say for them, you know, the Lord told us that we need to, um, to be patient. Luke chapter 21, verse 19. By patience, possess your souls. You realize the Rockefeller family's been patient for over 120 years, three generations. They've been working on this thing. They've been patient. Well, why is it with Christians that we just want to throw up our hands and give up and feel like we're missing out on the party? No, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Love the Lord. Serve Him. Jesus also told us not only to wait, but to watch. Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray. In reality, that's all we got. Do you realize that the satanic influence, no reason, there's, there's a real good reason why Satan's called the prince of this world. He's got the money. The church don't have that much money. When you get down to it, if we all gave all we had the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we're still not going to come up to the billions that these folks have got. So what we have, guess what, is prayer. We get to call on Almighty God. And that's more powerful than all the money that they can muster together. Uh, so continue to, to wait and watch. Also warn, Luke 21, 36, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, that that day comes on you unexpectedly. In other words, be ready. Always be looking. The Lord didn't come yesterday, so he may come today, so I'm going to live in the light of the soon return of the Lord. And finally, work. Luke chapter 12, verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise steward or servant? Blessed is that servant whom when his master comes will find him doing his will. You say, Danny, what kind of work? It's called great commission work. It's the work that we have on our mission statement where we exalt the Savior, where we evangelize the sinner, where we equip the saved, where we encourage one another. Make sure that we encourage one another's soul as we go forward, even during these tough times. Amen? Amen. You know, uh, if you're a Christian, this sermon should have excited you that Jesus is coming soon. If this sermon depressed you or worried you, you may be getting a little too adjusted to this world. I'm just saying. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hard words, like in Revelation chapter 13, where there's so much symbolism, it's hard to figure out what's going on. Lord, help us to get into your word 
Go back and read the whole Bible and realize these symbols have already been spoken of before and use those to unlock what your message is to us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful even as we anticipate the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray if there's someone here today that's not yet ready to meet him, not yet put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that today is the day that they would be saved. And Lord, for those of us who are already Christians, who've trusted Christ as our Savior and Lord, uh, Lord, help us not get weary in well-doing. Help us not give it up, but continue to fight on uh, doing those things you've called us to do in your great commission of going into the world and making disciples of the nations. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now's our time of invitation. Our altar's open if you need to come and pray. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'm standing down front. I'd love to lead you to pray a prayer of faith and ask the Lord to become your Savior and Lord. Maybe you've already done that sometime before, but you've never made a profession of faith and been baptized. I'll be standing down here again. I'd love to help you go through that. Maybe you're already a Christian and you're saved and baptized and uh, your membership is somewhere else, but you feel like the Lord is leading you to come here and find your place of service. Won't you join our church today? Maybe you just need to rededicate your life to being faithful to the Lord till he comes. That's what this altar's for. Just come and pray. And know that you have praying people around the building will be asking God to hear your prayer without knowing your business. So stand together and let's sing this hymn of invitation. Won't you come? soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us in no more that dominion but more
thank you for being here today, for your attention, for your prayers. I know that was a lot, so go home and think about it some more, okay? That's kind of a long sermon there today, but um, uh, again, I think once you start to wrap your head around that, it kind of makes news make more sense than what it did before, once you kind of know what's going on in the world, and, and believe it or not, I do believe Revelation is going to come true. I realize some people say, well, it's just an allegory, times were hard during the time of the Romans. Uh, well, times were hard during the time of the Romans, guess what? We can get tough again, too. So again, prepare yourself, prepare your families for this. Um, again, um, pray for our folks. Uh, we've, we've had more COVID positive cases in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, than we've had through the whole six months of it. So we're not sure all that's going on with that. Uh, we don't think we have a spreader in the church. We're trying to single you out if you are. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it does seem like most folks we've talked to that they are not sure where they got it or got it other places or whatever. Uh, but let's pray that these folks get well uh, so that we can uh, and pray that the whole thing goes away uh, so that we can start gathering back together uh, as, as Christians in person again. Uh, so make that a matter of prayer. Also uh, be in prayer for our Brother Nick's family too as uh, we'll be helping them through their time of bereavement uh, during the days ahead. Uh, ask Brother Tim, if you will, to dismiss us in prayer. Let us pray. Father, the great prophet Isaiah said in chapter 25 that he would praise God for the past, praise God for the present, and praise God for the future. you got to understand that Isaiah was living in a time of destruction. His country had been destroyed. But he knew that God was faithful during all that time, and he praised him anyway. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the one that brings the word each week. I pray that uh, Danny's health would stay well. And Father, that you would bless this church as we try to spread the gospel throughout our area and the world. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.